Welcome back to the DJ Sessions, where we feature the best DJs and producers from around the world. I'm your host, Darren, and right now I'm sitting in the virtual studios in Seattle, Washington, and coming in all the way from halfway around the world from Germany, we have the Voicians in the studio, in the house today on the virtual sessions. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, man. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm super honored. Welcome. Yeah, we're excited to be talking with you. I was listening to some of your tracks before, you know, the interview. I always like to do the research on my the artists I, I interview and, you know, reverse. And we'll talk about reverse in just a second. But you know what? I was listening to your SoundCloud and Mask of Joy comes on and yeah. I'm sitting there listening to it. I'm like, oh, this is so amazing. This is so awesome. And it was funny because then I'm listening to SoundCloud and this next track comes on. I go, wow, this one sounds amazing and awesome too. And I go, wait a second, this is Mask of Joy again. And it like played twice. And I was like, oh, awesome. A second dose of Thanks. it. Thanks for the yeah. praise. <laughs> yeah, no, it was just really, really awesome to, to listen to that track. But, uh, you. you know, your music is described as kind of, you know, obviously you're doing electronic rock meets drum and bass. And yeah. it, it's also heralded as being theatrical and at moments kind of being dark and brooding. And when I was listening to Mask of Joy and Reverse, you know, I was thinking this is soundtrack kind of music. This is a, I was explaining to my friends a couple of years ago, the type of music I prefer to listen to. And a lot of it is that theatrical soundtrack. It's going to move you at a moment kind of music. And and just want to say that that was a, two awesome productions. Um, Thank you very much. You're very that, welcome. That means a lot that you that you mentioned. You you think it's um, like a bit soundtrackish because that's always my approach to just combine genres and no limits to any genre or just drum bass or just this or that. I like to mesh it all up, and especially since you mentioned um, it sounds a bit rocky in for you, and uh, that's because I also basically come from a rock background and I also love. Pendulum, for example, which a band that brought me into drum bass many years ago, um, which I still love to this day. Uh, to this day, and so I'm always inspired by by rock, of course. And I listened to metal when I was young, and still listen to it. And so I always switch it up and yeah. combine everything. I was just talking with Miss Isis uh, about um, drum and bass, and 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 Pendulum came up in the conversation. That yeah. song. <laughs> The song Tarantula is the one that always just makes me lose my shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally. Just, still, wow. still, such such yeah. a great track still. Uh, yeah. all, you know, I love all of their albums. Yeah. Uh, such a huge inspiration. And I think you can hear it when you listen to my music. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and when coming into talking about um, one of your latest releases, just, just recently, uh, Reverse, what was the inspiration behind the track Reverse? Uh, when you go into it, do you do you choose a theme or a model, or you 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 say you're going for kind of a theatrical track? But is there something behind that that's really the the inspiration behind your tracks when you design them? Um, depends. Reverse. I wrote this during the first lockdown um, in when was it? 2020, I guess. Yep, 2020. <laughs> uh, I started to write it there and I just jammed and I was missing the, you know, playing gigs and live clubs and everything. And I used to DJ. Um, I still DJ when it's possible, obviously, but I missed like the, the dance floor uh, energy, the crowd and stuff. So I wanted to make a, a dance floor banger, if you want to call it like that, um, like a DJ able track. But I also... For some reason, I started with the drop, which was basically the bass line and the, the, the leads, but I wanted to have an atmospheric uh, atmospheric intro because I imagined dropping this in a huge club, it will be very epic with a soundtrackish intro. And I always love stuff that is drowned in reverbs because I think it just creates a great atmosphere. And I'm also super inspired by Subfocus and Culture Shock Dimension and all these producers are very melodic in their production but also have this fierce bass lines and i always love this this combination of nice and good melodies with a great bass and basically i just wanted to write a banger that still has 
feeling like emotions in there. So yeah. When I was a kid That's growing everything. Yeah, I totally. When I was a kid growing up in, in the studio, my brothers were musicians and my dad had financed them a studio. Not kind of similar to what it looks like you have right back there. Maybe another oh. we'll, we'll talk about some of the pieces of gear you have back yeah. there, but um, one of the things I fell in love with was the synthesizer and yeah, the pads, yeah. the rises, you know, that 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 sound that you just get that which now is, you know, atmosphere. You know, I really yeah. have always been a fan. And, and one of my stations I listen to a lot is a station uh, out of San Francisco called Groove Salad by Soma FM. And it's a lot of down tempo ambient Mm -hmm. music that just has a lot of those pads of synths yeah. that are in there that it's a lot of atmospheric music it just kind of calms me down it's my version to me is classical music i'm just totally. but also can be very big and impactful you know used in the right way so that's awesome um you know when it comes to um, music theory do you think djs should learn music theory uh or does it matter that much when it comes to producing dance music Uh, well, depends. I, I don't think it's necessary to have uh, theory backgrounds. Um, I, for one, I have a background. Um, I played in orchestras when I was uh, younger. When I was, I think, eight, I started playing the clarinet <laughs> and I played in some orchestras and obviously um, learned how to read notes and all the theory on, on sheet music. And I also learned playing the piano for a few years, but then I stopped uh, going to the lessons because I hated uh, just learning, you know, or already written songs. And I, every time I wanted to practice, I ended up like, nah, that's way too hard. And I just jammed on my piano. And my mom was, why, why can't you still play a whole track? What is wrong with you? And I said, no, I just don't like it. Uh, I always loved playing my own kind of music that I came up with and I didn't even know if it made sense. And when it comes to production, I think a lot is feeling what sounds right to you. And what sounds right to you doesn't mean um, it sounds right to everyone else. Or even if, if you come from a, the a theory background and you say, that has to sound right. Some people say, no, that sounds boring or whatever. So for me, it's everything you do in the studio is um, just do what you love, what sounds great, try out some stuff. Um, it definitely helps to know scales and chords and chord progressions. I would say that's a benefit if you know that. So if you are not into theory, you can just learn basic uh, chord progressions theory reading notes maybe and see what notes fit into what scale that helps but it's not necessary if you ask me so just well, do whatever you want <laughs> you know you could you could you could thank your mom for giving you those lessons get you into that because you know <laughs> something that happened to you recently i mean it's been over the last few years but something you mentioned recently was you always dreamt to be on mousetrap monster cap yeah, monster totally. cat and disciple years ago and now you've released and locked in on all those within the last two years yeah you know so congratulations on that endeavor i mean it, it must i know what it's like when i have something like I, i i have djs or producers that i would really love to have on my show and when i get wind on it i try not to fanboy very often but it's like ah i'm gonna get something you know and <laughs> It was, was that do you feel that same kind of way when you get picked up by a label or uh, you know they say we would love to have this we'd love to release that is that was that like fanboy moment for you these are dude you know. ab absolutely like um the <laughs> the releases you you're talking about were only um vocal features where i sang on the tracks but anyway oh. i i appeared on the labels and i was credited and it was absolutely a fanboy moment when the mousetrap <laughs> release happened because um i did this with uh, my friend no mana he's a great producer also on mousetrap and it all started you know i, I sent out a tweet to him like it started out like that i was like, hey if you ever want some vocals i love your music and i was listening to his tracks like every day and i love just he's also a very melodic producer which i love as just mentioned and i just then who cares i just tried and then he um we, we we chatted a bit and he said yeah dude totally if you have some uh, top line send me something if you have something and i 
for some reason I had a top line and I never have top lines laying around, but this was basically a top line I once written and we, he loved it and we worked on it more. And then he told me, yeah, it's going to be for mousetrap and yeah, they picked it up and it's on my album. I was like, Oh my God, cool. Awesome. And then I really fanboyed when that mouse, he has his radio show mousetrap radio and he announced uh, like um, he always plays the new releases. And he announced, yeah, there's a new track with no mana and Voiki, Voice, Voikel. He couldn't pronounce my name. <laughs> like, like he had troubles with it, which is fair, I guess, with that name. But I, I thought it's so funny. And I was like, dude, the guy, the younger me in 2006, 17 year old, a uh, 17 year old Daniel would have never believed that that mouse would ever read out his name or tries to read out his name or what what not and so that was a fanboy moment definitely and i had a second single with no mana and that also appeared on mousetrap and he played this a few times on the show and each week my name changed like in the pronunciation and so, uh, at some point he, he pronounced it correctly <laughs> but yeah that was a fanboy moment and yeah, that was that's awesome! Congratu congratulations yeah. on that. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, so never give up. Yeah, and, and I was gonna say one of the things I, yeah. I quite see I, I see a lot on on the show when I'm interviewing people, and I, I say this quite frequently as as kind of a, a word of advice to uh, up and coming producers or or DJs is you know you will miss. I want to say, I, I don't, I hope I don't misquote this, but I want to say it was Michael Jordan. Maybe not. Please, internet, do not murder me if I get this wrong. <laughs> but it was, uh, you miss 100% of the shots you never take, you know, and exactly. you never know when that Twitter message could just be something yeah, that yeah. just hits you, you know, and you're like, you just out of the blue, I'm just going to message him and see what happens, message him and see what happens. Funny enough, today I'll give a drop. One of the first ever celebrity DJs or big name DJs that was on our show was Dave Dresden uh, from mm -hmm. Dresden and Gabriel and played our played my bedroom basically back in the day. You can watch that episode later, but today <laughs> I still hold him in such high regard. He's such a great person, such a great talented DJ and producer, him and Gabriel, um, him and Josh, I should say. Um, but um, today I'm on Facebook and I had this post out about social media and Dave chimes in on it and I'm kind of like, thanks, Dave. And he's <laughs> talking about certain things about the facets of social media. And uh, it just so happens that I was on my TikTok the other day and I happened to see Dave on TikTok and he had done this kind of funny thing on TikTok and commenting back and forth. But you never know who's watching, who's going to respond, who's going to be there. And, and, and going to that post I mentioned about, it was talking about how socials, you know, younger people are running the socials and doing that and blowing up there. You know, and if you don't necessarily work the socials, you better have some other avenue to be getting yeah. fans and followers and staying in touch with the public, especially over the last two years. You know, if you weren't, if you didn't have a social following and you were relying on posting on Facebook, let's say to just your friends, which maybe 5% of those are going to see your post, you're probably not going to grow your listener base. You're probably not going to grow who's reaching right. out to you. And if you're not networking online using Twitter, using Instagram, you know, or even Discord is a huge one out yeah. there getting on the Discord mm -hmm. servers. Uh, we talked a little bit pre-show about VR and we'll get into that in a minute and networking yeah. in there. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely, I, I love those kind of stories. I hear those kind of stories where you just, because that gives inspiration. And I think more people should do that. Reach totally. out. You know, um, I, I, I have to admit, I always have problems. Um, um, with social media, like posting and I, I'm bad at it. I'm, I should post more. I should create more content and which I, in, in theory would love to do, but then I, you know, I, I will do this at some point and I will post more, but I realized you also need some kind of idea of what you're doing on socials because everything gets lost very quickly these days. And, but one thing you should definitely do is like message people, um, who you like and try to come up with a collaboration never hurts and it worked out for me a few times already so 
And also yeah. the other way around, when, when people approached me and I was surprised they wanted to work with me, and I was like, yeah, of course, let's do it. I, you know? I was talking with somebody recently and they said, back in the day, before you know computers exist, you would go out to the nightclubs to network, hang out, yeah. meet those people, meet the DJs, say, hey, let's collab, let's get together. And you might make one connection per night. And now their model is, is hey, I try to go out and make at least 10 connections per week, I believe it was, online. Mm -hmm. And, and okay, just say, hello, hi, I'm a fan. I'd like to connect with you. You know, there's so many tools out there. You can keep literally a back-end database yeah. going of who you're talking to, when you reached out with them, what's going on, and project manage that to start building and collaborating with people. Um, one of the people we just had on the show recently, too, uh, you may know, I hope I say his last name right, but I, uh, it's Robert Babiz, Babiz, Babizich, Babiz, Babiz. I always say it wrong because this is a hard one to get. But Robert, he does like online. He's very approachable. You know, you message him and say, "Hey, I'm working over here." He'll go, "Hey, jump online. We'll do a Zoom." And I'll, I'll I'm not trying to speak on his behalf. I'm not his agent, but <laughs> in a sense, it's, "Hey, we'll jump on a Zoom. We'll do something. We'll talk about this." And and say, "Hey, would you like to come in and check out one of my classes I offer and, and be part of my master class program?" And it's just really, really awesome how the internet, obviously, after so many years of being out there, has really brought the world of music together and collaborating, uh, getting people to collaborate that maybe would never collaborate. You could have somebody in, you know, California that collaborates now with somebody in Germany, you know, yeah, um, happens a lot, <laughs> happens a lot, you know, all the yeah. time. Um, but enough on, on internet and socials, uh, you know, going to the type of music that you produce, you know, kind of heralded as electronic rock, drum and bass. Do you yeah. see yourself producing different styles of music in the future? Um, the thing is for my Voicians project, um, I will stick, most likely will stick to drum and bass with rock elements and build that out and focus on vocal features and stuff. But I produce a lot of different genres for television and media. And I do production music for basically that you produce music for a library and that ends up being aired on TV or on the radio and stuff. And I produce all kinds you can imagine there. Like I produced last year, I produced um, uh, a soundtrack album for documentaries. Then I produced a dark urban scenes. It's called, it's like action, action loaded tracks, or I produced a summer house album and the vintage album. So I can, do all kinds of crazy, um, crazy stuff uh, and different genres. And I think that's super refreshing to have something like this on the side because sometimes when we come back to the, the, the hybrid music I do, I'm sometimes limited too much in, within my genre. For example, sometimes I produce a track and it's meant to be for dance floor. And then I think, no, orchestras here is too much maybe and then i feel a bit limited by the dance flourish approach of drum bass because i can do everything if you if you want a track that gets played out or something because you have to follow at least some rules when it comes to structure and um the the energy the energy of the drop and stuff like that so having production music on the side is very refreshing and i can basically do all that stuff and i um, it's also very inspiring and coming up with different uh, styles of music is always a, a challenge because you haven't done it before and while you try to achieve um uh, producing this genre you learn new stuff you can use for your other music again and i think it's a great thing and i also do soundtracks for video games at least i started doing this like writing little cues and stuff here and there and that's also the same um always refreshing and fun and i can highly recommend that to anyone who's burned out by his genre if you want to call it like that we're going to be talking about the video game production in just a moment here yeah. i'm glad you brought that up uh if you could score a hollywood movie what director would have your preference what director? What, sorry. Oh, like if you could score a Hollywood movie and you yeah. wanted to work with somebody who, who directs wow. movies, who, who uh, you know, uh, who would that be? Who would you want to work with as a, as a director of, of scoring a movie with? I would love some, you know, some 
some movies that are a bit dark. <laughs> um, maybe yeah, Christopher Nolan or something like that. Having this this hybrid again. Uh, I, I think of Hans Zimmer now, obviously, because he also combines orchestra with pulsing synths and modular synths and stuff. Um, I guess someone who makes a kind of mysterious, dark, moody movie, that would be something for me, like doing soundscapes and orchestras and yeah, using my analog synths and stuff, some guitars here and there. That's my style. So yeah, I would go for Christopher Nolan. He makes this this kind of movies that I like. Like always a bit confusing as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, Tenet so, was a little like, what's going on here? Apparently there's supposed same, to be a part same here. two or prequel feeling. or something coming out. I've only watched, I think I've only watched it once. Um, yes, but yes, I yes. loved it. I loved it. It was great. I just I, I should go back and watch that again and go. Oh, whoa. <laughs> you know, that yeah, was... Tenet, Tenet was a bit... I don't know. I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan, but that movie didn't catch me that much, to be honest. I liked it and the, like the cinematography and everything and the score, obviously, uh, great, but it didn't catch me that much. Mm -hmm. But maybe I should watch it again. So I might do this. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, you know... Um... Check it out. I, you know, I'm inspired to go watch it again now that we're talking about it. Yeah, um, I, I do the same. <laughs> so, you know, you're in your studio right now, sitting there. And, you know, most people, they don't understand production when it, what goes on behind the scenes. They probably think, oh, I just came up with a song. I go to a computer. I type it in and it boo, pops out something really cool. Yeah. Uh, but producing music stands synonymous with spending countless hours behind the computer screen or on your, on your gear you know, yeah. producing beats. What do you do in your free time to stay fit? What I, well, I'm not that fit. <laughs> um, <laughs> you mean like uh, going to the gym or something? Do you do anything else besides spend time in the studio? Yeah. And what do you do? I, what are well, your outside activities? I, I go to CrossFit uh, sessions um, three, uh, three times a week. But I have to say Corona and everything... <laughs> was like a good excuse to not do anything and but i i uh, increased uh, my workout sessions again and um i sometimes go out for a walk and stuff like that and but yeah i have to say i should do more again and the crossfit is is much fun and also a challenge as well it's always like a hard challenge and uh, perfect for me basically because i have a trainer who kicks my ass <laughs> because i if i would do exercise by my own i would be way too lazy and there you have a trainer who says no again 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 and <laughs> even though you're totally smashed already so <laughs> that's my approach but yeah awesome. i should go running as well <laughs> in between and i take it since we're in your studio you're in your studio right now that this question is kind of like a no-brainer. Are you a hardware or software producer or both? And what are your some of your favorite pieces that you use uh, hardware-wise and or programs that you use software-wise? Um, I'm obviously a hardware fan, but I am also a software fan. So, of course, I, I use both um, heavily. And I also rely on both heavily. Um, I love hardware for the inspiration it gives you. And I know there's a debate whether hardware sounds better or software or this synth sounds better than a software synth or whatnot. But for me, it, it's, of course, I love the sound of the hardware and it's also like, sorry. Um, um, it's always a great sound to have an analog synth. That's for sure. But for me, the main thing I'm, I'm why I'm using these are for the inspiration because sometimes you are playing around uh, on the synth and you're twisting knobs and you, for, exa for example, the modular synth, that is insane what you can do with it. And sometimes you just have one little glitchy bass sound that inspires you to create a whole track. And I also do uh, sound design for uh, brands and whatever. And I... 
I sat down with the modular. Um, maybe I should show this. There's more. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a, that's, that's a whole tower, <laughs> a whole tower of madness. <laughs> and uh, I had to do this brand logo and like an audio jingle. Like, um, and I, I was twisting knobs and connecting cables here and there. And suddenly I had it super weird sounds I, I could have never produced in software i could have maybe if i would have known what i want if it makes sense mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely i just played around rec i record everything and there it was and that turned out to be the, the logo for the, the the audio brand and that's the the main thing for me to have hardware because it it makes you think out of the box literally and in combination with software, it's perfect. And you ask what my favorite pieces are for that. And yeah, obviously the modular is one of my favorite pieces in the studio because of endless creativity. Also, I love MOOC, uh, MOOC synthesizers like the Matriarch here or the studio system there. That's uh, three little units. Love it. Absolutely cool. And I also do voiceover and vocal stuff and they're... For that, I have this tube tech compressor here. That's a classic. Um, maybe, no, we don't see um, the light. <laughs> anyway, that's that's like, for me, a must have personally because it's awesome compressor for, for voice and stuff. And when it comes to software, well, I, I don't know where to start. Um, I think there's so many essential plugins for me out there that I can't even name. Well, FabFilter is my favorite brand probably. I love also like Sooth and Spliff, uh, Spiff, um, the plugins by Oak Sound, I think. And yeah, ob obviously Native Instruments and Spitfire libraries and orchestral tools, amazing orchestral stuff. Serum, Xfer, of course. And yeah, the, the classics, basically. I use everything. I lose, I, I use, in some projects, I use zero more and others i use spire a bit more and sometimes i only use hardware synths and just layer them with some in the box uh since so always depends and i could talk the whole day about all of this gear so i don't <laughs> want to bore you <laughs> but yeah that's I, that's it, it basically yeah we, and, and you know technology moves really fast in producer DJ land, if you could think of something that's not on the market today, but in your vision would be really amazing to be out there on the market, what would that be? That is a good question. What <laughs> is out there that I needed? I don't know. Uh, that is, uh, I don't miss Right now, I don't miss anything in my studio and I got used to my workflow. So it's hard for me to imagine about something that I would need. I, I, I don't know. I, I can tell you. That's a tough question. I'm, I'm happy as it is, but I'm looking for innovations, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe that's a d diplomatic answer. <laughs> if, if, yeah, if, if you can, here's a question for you. If you could steal one item from Dead Mouse's studio, what would that be? Oh, that's a that's an easy that's an easy <laughs> question. I would steal his Neef console, like his huge console. Um, that's amazing. Uh, analog summing. I I would need his space, of course, but yeah, I don't have the space, so I I probably wouldn't take this one. But yeah, that's a good one. Like his Neef console. Neef console. Yeah. All right, Ted Mouse, awesome. be on the lookout. <laughs> if it <laughs> no goes worries. missing, you know where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no, no. It's at... Now, have you ever experimented with mixing audio and video at the same time? And if not, would that be something you'd be willing to try out? Yeah, I, I did this a few times. I, um, I sometimes do, um, on the, A, uh, I sometimes have to over voice videos for uh, commercials because I also do, as mentioned, like the voiceover stuff. And there you have a video and you're over voicing it with only a voice. But I also did some projects where, where I wrote music fitting to the picture. That's rather rare at the moment, but it's definitely something I would love to do more. Um, we come to soundtrack here again. 
I love just writing music for a certain topic or um, yeah, I'm, I'm like a movie or a game because it's, I think, I think it's cool to have a vision already of how it looks and then coming up with a sound that fits the look. And I think that's awesome to um, write to picture. And so, yeah, movie, movie soundtracks, that's something I want to do at some, uh, at some point like at least use awesome. for it yeah and did you um a lot of people jumped into live streaming a few years ago yeah. um you know when we were doing we've been we were doing our show for about 10 years and yeah, we saw the advent of everyone jumping online you know i used to knock on doors telling people oh we're a live streaming dj show we're on twitch and people would say why would anyone want to watch a dj online what's twitch And now everyone out there is, you say, yeah. oh, we're, you know, we're on Twitch. We're a DJ show. Oh yeah. I watch DJ shows all the time. Now I listen to my workout. I listen to my car. I listen to him here. It's like, thank you world for finally coming getting up to speed. Did you do anything in the live streaming world? Um, or do you have anything currently in the live streaming world? Um, I also, when it comes to live stream, I, I'm also some kind of grandpa, to be honest, because um, you remember you stream. I, that's where we got started. <laughs> oh, really? You did? Okay. Yeah, we were a featured partner all... with them. Ah, sick. Because that's the that was the first time I was streaming out of my studio in 2011 or 12, I can remember, or something yeah. maybe in that area. Um, also, Dad Mouse inspired me there to go on Ustream because he started, I think it was Dad Mouse who streamed there. Mm -hmm. I can I can remember at the time there was at the time there was Ustream. Well, in 2009 when we started, it was Ustream, live stream, Justin TV, which later got purchased by Twitch, mm -hmm. and those are pretty much the prominent ones out there yeah. at the time. Um, yeah. But yeah, I th I think it was Ustream, and I I um, dabbled in, in streaming out of my studio and showing how I do music and stuff. But obviously, back then, nobody cared. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway i i i started streaming on twitch in 2015 i think uh also doing like production sessions and playing some games here and there and for some reason uh, i always did it but not like every week or every day or something i did it when i felt like doing it and once covid started and everyone was in lockdown for some reason i stopped doing it <laughs> because mm -hmm. i I thought, okay, everyone is doing this now, and uh, which is fine and obviously fair uh, to do it. But I, I didn't feel very inspired at this moment. And so I stopped streaming. And half a year later, because I also thought, how long is this lockdown going to take? And I don't want to commit to something like doing everything every week and stuff. And at some point after half a year, I realized, okay, I, I don't have anything to do, no DJ gigs. I just move all my DJ gear into my living room and set up a Twitch setup. And for once I do it right and set up a cool session for every Wednesday. And I, I was streaming out of my living room for a few months every Wednesday and play DJ sets, um, drum bass sets, of course, um, because I, I only DJ drum bass stuff would love to do some house music at some point but anyway i did drum bass sessions there and that was really refreshing then again and to see that so many people are into twitch and some other cool producers um started doing this and i i saw the communities growing and growing which is great obviously but um at some point i was bored again and i stopped doing it and i haven't streamed in months But I thought about it the other day, setting up something again. But I'm not sure yet. I, I have so many other projects going on right now. But in general, it's great that streaming is finally in the mainstream and people know what, what we are doing there. And also cool that it's accepted that well and people are willing to try it out and don't say, oh, it's only nerds and stuff. It's no, it's like everyone is doing it, you know? <laughs> Because I remember when I did Heard. this, I did this, uh, I was just saying this because a friend of mine said this to me when I was streaming on 2000, uh, 2016 or something. He said, dude, you're such a nerd. Why are you doing this? 
I was like, because I, because I like it, <laughs> yeah. who cares? Yeah. yeah, I definitely, um, that was one of our missions back when we first started was to bridge that gap. Cause I've been a video guy my entire life in video production, producing, you know, going backwards, it was live streaming to podcasting, to broadcast yeah. television, to public access, you know, and, and just adapting with these new mediums. And we're going to be talking about the next reiteration of what's coming down the line in just a few moments. But um, yeah, it was kind of musicians and producers. They didn't have video production skills and setting up a studio and live streaming yeah. and worry about bandwidth and issues and lighting and everything that comes along with that. And it's one thing to you know put up cameras, but then you got to host the show and you got to be yeah. personable on camera. You got to be engaging in the chat room and you got to do all that stuff. And a DJ, when, they, when you're producing music, you're doing, you're in the music. You don't have time to go over to yeah. the chat room and talk with people, yeah. you know, so then they got to get a moderator and, and the whole setup of that, you know, just it's, it's a lot to take on. And that's one of the gaps we were looking to bridge back in 2009 when we moved from a podcast broadcast television world to a live streaming environment yeah. and keeping that audience engagement there at all times is, is obviously something yeah. that was, is hard to do. <laughs> you have to, these days, you're not a DJ or producer. You're a producer, a DJ, a VJ, a Photoshop person. You are everything. You, you have Social to, media manager. Everything. Yeah, <laughs> you have to, the 360 degree package, you know, you are doing like in best case you have management or someone who helps you out with that stuff. But yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's tough to, I think if you start, if you start doing streaming, you are kind of lost at the beginning and you, you think, Oh, what do I need? By the way, Oh, Elgato. And you look up uh, like Elgato or other devices that help you getting the camera signal into the computer and, and you have to set up everything and bandwidth here and there and overlays and whatnot. And, Yeah, it's but that's also something cool. I think a great challenge and an inspiring new area to explore, especially for producers. If them when they lose gigs at the moment due to the pandemic and stuff, it's a great way to compensate that a little bit. But for me, playing the real shows will always be, of course, the 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 real thing. Absolutely, but, you know. And I was speaking with somebody, you know, that those that jumped on board if they were to capitalize upon it and, and, and really move forward with it, you know, you might have a, you might not be able to leave Europe right now or get your visas to come to the United States or, or travel. But I was watching a show the other night with uh, IAMX. Um, he's with uh, yeah. sneaker pimps yeah. and he did a, a kind of private show um, the other night and people just, I mean, from all over the world, he can't get out. You know, he's playing on the West, some, something on the West coast in the States here, but he can't get, get out to go other places. So his fans yeah. could come in there and watch the show. And, and man, I saw people donating $5, $15, $20, $50. Yeah. Somebody's like 150 bucks to watch this mm -hmm. online live production. Mm -hmm. And I watched the whole thing. It was phenomenal. Definitely worth, you know, if you, if you had to set a price of admission, what's a ticket like that worth, you know, and if your fans, if you can't go to see your fans in person, Will yeah. they go online to watch you do something live online and interact online? Yeah. And, you know, if you could do something like that once a month, you do the math on this. And if you're able to get, say, $10 a month <clears throat> from a thousand fans, you know, you're at $10,000 a month and you have an exclusive show for them. You know, you're at 120 grand in extra revenue a year and you're really not destroying your outward, your presence that you may only be able to play 12 shows that year or 10 yeah. show or, or 20 shows, or even if you're not touring, you can do something off tour, you know, it, it just, it's going to be an interesting mix to see how this rolls out yeah, for the yeah. future of on demand. And, and like I said, if I was a fan and I wasn't able to like, let's say you're coming to play New York. Well, if I'm not able to make it to New York, but I still want to go see your show and I'm at home and I have the time I could log into anywhere in the world and go, boop, I'll pay 15 bucks to watch that show, yeah. you know? Okay. And how many other people could, could do that? And, and, you know, it's going to be a very interesting world where the promotion companies, the big ones, because in the writers, it usually says no recording, no live streaming, no distribution of the show yeah. whatsoever. And are they going to start looking into that pay-per-view model, which will then obviously trickle down to the industry going, Hey, I'm going to live stream. When I go to a nightclub, I'm live streaming my set. Um, 
we're right now looking into the possibility of being able to right now you can lock down a country. So like, let's say you came and played the U S you could say, this isn't going to stream in the United States, but it'll stream everywhere else in the world. So that way it doesn't impact local ticket sales, but your fans around the world and who are not going to yeah. fly all the way to the States to see your show for, you know, 35 or 50, whatever you charge for your show. Um, I mean, they might, that'd be awesome to have fans that dedicated, but they can at least tune in and still follow you and what you're doing and watch these live shows. And, you know, you could sell different yeah. levels of packages of tickets of, you know, have a normal, a regular experience, have a, this tiered experience, have a VIP experience, have a special cam experience where you're in the VIP cam in the booth on the stage with the artist and the artist can chat with you during the, I don't know, man, it can go really crazy. Um, yeah. I which brings, it will, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was yeah, going to say, yeah, go ahead. I think, I think it will be more and more definitely, um, a way for um, promoters or events or whatever or DJs to extend their audience. Definitely, I I I always like the. If for example, you had a festival and they also streamed it on YouTube, uh, parallel. I think some festivals did this in the past and still doing it, and I think that's awesome because I you you quickly get FOMO these days and say, man, I would love to be there, and now you can sit in your living room and just watch the sets you want to watch and i think that's a great thing definitely so yeah and something uh on that whole live streaming events standpoint we have a very aggressive set schedule this year to get back on the ground uh you know this is the virtual sessions we can do this all all the time but i personally like it when we're on the ground get to talk to the people in person with that microphone in hand you know i think on our schedule right now we're looking at ultra music festival edc nice. We're doing we're doing sonar and we're doing ADE this year, you know, of awesome. getting on the ground and really and setting up a footprint at these events to where, you know, we'll have a full presence and a live streaming presence. <clears throat> and we're excited yeah. for it. It, it. Things are in the works. Don't quote me. Don't hold me to it. But we know sonar is probably going to come up at ADE is going to come up. So there's enough time to plan for it. Ultra is just right around the corner. And, you know, we so but uh, an EDC is around the corner, too. Um, but maybe yeah, we're excited we, for that. Maybe we see each other at ADE. I try to get to ADE <clears throat> this year again. I I skipped last year, obviously. <laughs> I think there was an ADE, a small version. Mm -hmm. Last time I was at ADE was in 2019. And I was in 18. And yeah, I love it. ADE. Yeah, Amazing. we're definitely going to have... I mean, yeah. we're really excited for Sonar uh, in Barcelona. But ADE is going to be a, a focal point for us to, we're just now getting into talks with them about getting over there. And then we have to arrange and press yeah. clearance, all that fun stuff. And our footprint, it's going to be exciting because I, I want to put stamps in my new passport and uh, you know, I have never been to Europe. So really excited oh, to, to get over there yeah. and have, yeah. Have a blast, dude. We'll yeah. Have a blast. <laughs> it's going to be a fun time. Um, but speaking of the next level of technology, and this is something I was really looking forward to getting to talking to you with, um, because I was happened to be in virtual reality the other day. And do you happen to own an Oculus or are you in VR at all ever? No, uh, I don't own a VR headset, but yeah, I was in a few VR uh, nightclubs already. So yeah. Yeah, uh, we are. We're actually working on our virtual reality nightclub. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the show and you mentioned uh, it was Muzz. Uh, Muzz, yeah, M-U-Z-Z. -Z. Yeah. And I looked at a, de a video of their nightclub and I think you said it was in VR chat. I'll be reaching out to, to them, him in a, totally. in a bit about that. He, really excited for our he's launch. Really a of pioneer there. Mm -hmm. Like, um, well, I'm not sure, um, but he's like building a super, <clears throat> he has built this very cool nightclub and everything that happens in this VR nightclub is basically live. The dancers are real persons. The VJ who does the light and uh, the videos yep. and stuff is like a real person controlling the VR nightclub. And obviously the DJ can DJ live and stuff. And to me, it's just mind blowing what technology can do these days. And I definitely want to check out this whole thing in a, with a VR um, um, like uh, headset at some point because I only did this uh, or attended this in on my screen basically at home with with my pc and of course a vr club should be like with a headset but yeah it's amazing what he's doing and you should definitely talk to him he's 
really pushing the limits there, I think. Yeah, I think that's definitely going to be an un, it's an untapped avenue right now. And it's only going to get better, bigger, yeah. more refined. And, and then obviously looking into the AR world. But what struck me the most is I know we had our interview scheduled for a, a few weeks now. I happened to go into a game called Synth Riders. Yeah. And I'm going down the play music list. I'm like, oh, hey, I, whoa, <laughs> I, I got an interview Oof. with him. This is crazy. This is awesome. To wolves, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in there, yeah. and you know, I was a big. I'm still a big Beat Saber fan. If you know the mm -hmm. the, the, the game, but yeah, I, I like synth. It. I like synth writers because now we go back to that music that I, the synthesizer, that pad, that feel that you're kind of yeah. like going with the music and. And I, I mean, I, you, I don't know if you played it yet or not, but it no. was odd, odd. It's I want to at some point. Yeah, Synth Riders to me takes me a little bit more on a ride, no pun intended, not trying to tie into the name. <laughs> Whereas Beat Saber, you're actually, you know, you got lightsabers, it's it's beats, and you're doing a lot of this and you're moving and stuff. You're beating but, stuff up. <laughs> yeah, but Synth Riders, it's just really like you're kind of like cruising through. And funny enough, I don't know if you remember the movie Labyrinth with David Bowie. Uh, uh jennifer connelly I, back I in the 80s I, i've seen it the other day is it where where stairs are at the ceiling and people are walking in there and there's a girl with a little with a little baby on? yeah 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 that's ah, labyrinth yeah, yeah, i saw yeah. i saw this on tv uh like a few weeks ago but <laughs> i i didn't watch the whole movie it's one of my top favorite movies of all time um, I will notice. Yeah, it's 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 a very good movie. Uh, actually, directed by George Lucas and Frank Oz, who Frank Oz was big with all the Muppets um, at the time. So uh, there wasn't a lot of green screening, so the the um, the set design was very. It was, it was all real set design. I mean, there was one scene in the movie where this is a green screen scene, and you could just in the '80s you could totally tell it was like bad green screen. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, just a very a very awesome visual movie but what was awesome going back to synth writers is somebody had beat mapped one of the songs out of that movie which is dance magic and when they beat mapped it they actually kind of made you like you're dancing like david bowie is in the movie oh wow okay, yeah because you, you can you can you can map the the movements to the track oh, really? so you that could have awesome. people that could take music videos look at the choreography in the music videos and then map the beats and you'd be dancing like the dancers. That's crazy. Yeah, and I, I just, I just, like I said, I came across your track there and I was like, wow, cool. And <laughs> it also led in my research to knowing that you do music for video games and things of that nature. So yeah. wasn't sure if you had a, a headset and, and if you played synth writers or not, no, maybe I, hook up in there sometime and, and, and play against each other. <laughs> it's on my list. Definitely. Um, yeah. But, the um, yeah, the synth writers track that got licensed, uh, like the Wolves, uh, was a track of my album Wasteland, and they licensed it, and I was yeah happy about it. I always love having my music in computer games, and recently last year, um, a track I did with Eddie on Monster Cat ended up being on Rocket League, which is a game that I've been playing since uh, 2016 or something. And that's also like a mind-blowing moment for me to because when the song got licensed for the game, you opened Rocket League, and for for a few weeks, the the game opened basically with my vocals, and it was totally mind-blowing to me. Like, yeah, the game I've been playing for years, and then my my music is in there. Amazing. Exactly. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I have not played Rocket. I've seen it, and that that looks like a lot of fun. That's that. It's it. so much fun, and I I'm so bad at it. Even though I've, <laughs> I've been playing it for six years, I don't get better. But a friend of mine, shout out Timo, and I we play it um, frequently and just chat. You know, we chat and see what's up and talk and play it. And we were so bad. It's incredible. We don't get do you, better. Do you when you when you play the different vehicles? Do they have different abilities for each of the vehicles no. on the field? Not not that I know. Uh, maybe I'm it's wrong. just just charismatic of what yeah, it looks it's like. Just like the look, you can you can change the design and the stickers and stuff and the look. I'm but... I'm looking for a new kind of tank game, first person shooter tank game. You know a that they would. Game? Yeah, tank like a mech. Well, actually, I just got in, jumped into a mech game. A mech like a you ever hear of mech warrior? Mac like you're in a big machine, like robot. a big, yeah, like a big robot. Like the stuff in the Avatar. 
yeah yeah something like avatar okay, yeah yeah, yeah. kind of like yeah that'd be kind of mech yeah totally and uh i just there's a new mech game in development on vr it's pretty cool and they just upgraded some stuff and it's so cool it's like you're really you sit down you're in a cockpit you grab the most you grab the controller that drives you around you grab the controller that controls your guns you got all these buttons and everything you can flip and switch and and do like you're in the cockpit of this thing Crazy. and they're going to release different models of these mechs with different weapons and you can upgrade it's it's gonna be really cool what's coming out I, on vr i but. really need to get a vr headset because it's uh, i'm i'm already in a few vr games like my music is in there and i never touched a vr headset so far and i need to see this finally because i think now is the time to get into it because vr is inevitable is this is a word i think inevitable yeah, can't stop it it will <clears throat> be there it will grow and <clears throat> it's probably the future and to some degree last so I, yeah yeah last year when my friend i was humming and hoeing about it i was talking about it in 2020 when when everything hit and the price point needed to come down or make it accessible like four weeks later they came out with the oculus 2 i was humming and hoeing over the summer my friend comes to me and says Darren, go get one. It'll be the best $300 you'll ever spend. I hummed and hoed for a couple of weeks. I went and got one down the, uh, down the store, down the street from my house, had it for two days. I went out and bought my mom and my dad one and said, you guys have Oculus oh, now too. Like oh. <laughs> you're going to do this. I do they like it. And yeah, my dad likes it. He's into it. He can do it. He shares it with his friends. My mom, I was just spending Christmas with her and I brought my Oculus over to her house and you know, she looks at it and goes, I don't want to play video games. I don't want to do that. I go, it's yeah. so much more than that. Mm -hmm. I got her into what's called, there's a, a first kind of tutorial that you do called first steps. And you get in and you kind of, you, you, you do some motion, like you, you learn how to pick up things. You learn how to interact with things. And then you go to this next scene where you actually dance with this little like robot character. Yeah. And she just lost her mind. She was just like, oh my God, this is so cool. And she just like, I just want to sit. She just wanted to sit in this first steps room and say, I never want to leave here <laughs> and just playing with the blocks and doing the things and, and shooting the rockets and driving the blimp around and playing, you know? Um, and then I showed her the shooting part of it. She was like, Oh, this is kind of cool. Okay. I go, but there's so much more. This is like the video game kind of aspect. You can watch movies. You can go and really? go into a movie theater and watch movies with other people. You know, and like you're in a, you sit down, I, you and I could go, hey, let's go check out Tenet, put on our VR headsets oh, and go watch like a, a current. Well, action. you got to watch out on some of the movies. They're probably not legal to stream. Ah, I but I just thought they're official cinemas, like licensed to the, to this game, basically. Yeah. But I mean, uh, if, if you have Netflix, you can go watch Netflix in VR and put it up and be watching it like you're in a theater. That's so, crazy. you know, when you look at VR and even cool. AR coming in and replacing, you know, I say five years from now, you're going to see a decline in TV sales and projector sales. You're going to go put your headset on when you're at home and you're going to watch TV and you're going to be able to say, hey, who wants to watch this movie with me in VR? And you're going to go, okay, boom, we'll do a Netflix share. And now five of your friends are watching that movie with you in VR and you're all sitting down in the theater. You got your drinks your popcorn whatever you're at home even first run movies coming out on like disney plus yeah and hulu you know they'll release them straight to straight to digital you know and you just sit back and watch the movies in your home and uh you know uh when ar gets gets out there you know right now it's everyone's you got to hold up your phone and do augmented reality like this but when the glasses come out we're going to be having this interview i'll be in front of the camera but you, I'll be looking at you in an AR environment. I won't even have a computer screen. I might just have a keyboard and I'm looking at all these virtual screens in front of me while we're doing a Zoom. I might have a camera and a keyboard, but the screen is gone. And even if it's tracking with hand gestures, yeah. I can move this around, you know, and, and just like I, Minority I Report. The movies like in Minority Report, a movie that you've seen like ages ago, they yep. were like doing this and that. And I, I remember thinking, nah. That will won't be ever be a reality. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm wrong. It, it, it it's, coming. it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. So, there, it's there. speaking about technology, or maybe actually technology from long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, are you a Star Wars fan, dude? 
Wait a second. <laughs> Oh, do you see that? Yeah, that's. Can I? Yeah, I'm a Star Wars fan. I take it's it you're not weird. only you're not only a Star Wars fan. You're also at a project that you put out recently, or kind of challenged the internet on, in regards to the Millennium Falcon, and building oh, yeah. a, a Millennium Falcon in your living room, and like, yeah. yeah. Tell us a little uh, bit about that. Um. Well, I. Well, it was rather a joke, or it is still a joke. <laughs> but you know, I love I I always loved uh, building Legos when I was young, obviously. And I I you know built this Darth Vader the other day, and I thought I saw this Millennium Falcon, and I thought, dude, it's so epic that that must be so much fun to build this. But then I thought, I don't want this actually. I just want to build it. But the huge millennium falcon i don't know where to put this thing <laughs> and so i thought someone wants to buy me the the millennium falcon and i built it for them <laughs> that was yeah and then, and then and then you send it over to them like yeah, i'll build it okay no there's there's no serious offer and i won't do this i i wouldn't accept this offer of course it was just a joke well um, but at some point i might do it i might build it for whatever reason and then i see what i do with it <laughs> well, I was, I was, it was, I wanted, I was so excited to ask you this question. And when you popped up for the interview and you were in your studio with all the flashing lights on, and then you powered up your modulator, you powered up some gear in the background and everything around you, I was kind of sitting there going, does he envision himself sitting in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon, you know, with uh, all the no. flashing <laughs> lights and everything around, you know, I, I well, mean, well, it sometimes feels like it, but yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I yeah. mean, I mean, I just thought it, it was kind of like a, it is, is it, it is a little, especially the modular system is a bit like a spaceship because yeah. when you everyone who, who uh, you know who sees this in the first play place and who doesn't have to do anything with music production uh, is saying, dude, why do you know any of this? What is this? Is this a cockpit? Like you said, like that's basically like the, the first uh, word that comes to mind. And I always say no, it's just different parts and you learn them while doing it and when you produce music you you i think you don't have a hard time to get into modular um because it makes absolutely sense when you when you start using it mm -hmm. so yeah but yeah sometimes i think i'm like a pilot <laughs> uh, awesome now is there anything you is there something like one thing or a piece of advice that you would give to new and up-and-coming producers to watch out for when it comes to making their career successful? Um, yeah, maybe uh, one thing, um, because we talked so much about hardware, I, I want to uh, stress this again, that you don't need any of this, of course. For me, it's like inspiration uh, to get, um, like devices to get inspiration from. But I always say it doesn't matter what you use. It matters how you use the stuff you have. Uh, either it is free freeware or like uh, other software synths or whatever you can do crazy stuff with freeware and you don't need big tools so that's one thing focus on getting to know the stuff you have and you can use already and then try to go from there and see what what is your thing i know many people who don't like hardware at all so that's fine and another thing is um yeah, always, you know, don't give up because making music, producing music is like, you know, it's so cliche, but um, music, producing music is not something you learn from today uh, in the night, you know, to tomorrow. You have to practice, practice, practice. And it's even though it doesn't matter how talented you are, you got to learn to use your tools. You got to understand how certain things work and i still after so many years of producing i think i started in 2007 or something my friends were going out every weekend and i spent the nights in the studio and everyone was like dude you're so boring come with us into the town and i was just uh mesmerized by by producing and i didn't want to do anything else and i was sometimes almost you know uh, i thought man i'm spending so much 
time with it and it still sounds that bad and stuff but then there are the little moments you have that you realize dude it i got better and this works like that and amazing and you you get you know inspired again and just stick with it produce 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 try to get better compare your stuff to i'm talking about production not about like songwriting just compare your try to do the best mix you can do and then compare it to others work and see where you can get better punch your drums better um you know stereo field or if the leads maybe could use more brightness or whatever so it's yeah it's a long process and sometimes frustrating but stick with it that's my advice you know it resonates what you gave what you said there really resonates with what i tell a lot of producers or people starting out doing podcasts or shows yeah um you know start with what you got you know if you to go if you go and you want to take a look back in the history of the dj sessions and what we started with and what i had to start with and what we played with and what we play with technology is a never-ending game but play with what you got and i tell people get what first determine what you want to spend you don't got to go spend twenty thousand dollars on all the high-end stuff start with something basic get in there nowadays you know in our world you can get a pretty much a decent setup for for probably about a thousand bucks you can get a nice setup but uh play with it break it play with it again figure out what's going on look at the key things look at your audio look at your lighting you know look at when you're distributing look at your social media look at those all those other factors but get in there and start making a show one of the most inspiring things to me, I don't know if you know the gentleman or not, but uh, Gary Vaynerchuk or Gary V, um, he made a video. He's a very uh, motivational, inspirational speaker, pretty popular guy. Um, and he had this video once that he made. It was like a two minute trailer about him talking about his career, talking about his growth. And what they did is they took a video and they put it up in this right hand corner area, like right here. And what it was, it was like a snapshot of like three seconds of every video that he had ever made. And mm-hmm. as it was going through, it put a counter on like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and was counting all these videos. And you could just see the progression of how his first videos, they really sucked. I mean, the production wise, they were garbage <laughs> to where he's at now, but you yeah. got to start somewhere, exactly. you know, and, and, and make it go forward. And I'm constantly battling with multiple different technologies on site do i use the live streaming gear do i use the hard line gear do i use this switcher do yeah. i bring in the backpack <laughs> which you know, i could talk about all that stuff for you but just start out and start find out what you like about it to find out if you really want to be in it one two the next level of technology is out there and there are so many people out there that will help that can that you can go to and we were talking about connecting and networking earlier in the interview yeah. about reach out to somebody and say, well, what do you use for your equipment in the studio? I like your production. And they're like, oh, we use like right now I'm using a Mikey element mic. I love this thing. It's awesome. You know, that might not work for somebody else who wants to show. They might want a mic that comes in and hangs. I don't know what kind of mic you're using right now. Looks pretty oh, the class. The classic. You know that one. There you go. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've, I have quite a few different mics, but that's also a nice topic, microphones. You know, when I was starting mm-hmm. out, I didn't even know. I thought, yeah, a microphone is a microphone, but <laughs> no. <laughs> no. There's so no. many different microphones for different uh, stuff to record. And that's, you know, I, I think if you find something that you really love doing and you want to do this for a living, um, you will get there eventually if you if you stick with it and don't force anything, just let it, let it flow, let it grow, get better at it. And it will come naturally that you build this. And if you put enough passion into something, it will lead to great things. And that's, that comes from me. I worked 10 years basically in, in like a real job and on the side, I made music and I went doing music full time, like two years ago. Uh, no, not two years ago. One and a half years ago, I always I'm confused since lockdown. You know my my brain. Yeah, is, I I lost the, like the the feeling for time. Anyway, I ended up doing this full time, and I built it on the side while I had a real job as a sound designer. The also a very great job doing like sound design for a living is not a bad job for me because I always love doing this stuff. So, 
but you know i i built it on the side and see i saw and checked if if it makes sense for me at all because i didn't want to dive in fully from the beginning that could also work for many people but for me it was better to grow it like on the side and see this is my thing can i do this and i build it like on the side and that's that's also something i can maybe say for new people who want to be a producer be a producer do it every day but um it's it's hard these days maybe to start from zero and it's it takes some time to grow and first check um if it's your thing and you know don't get frustrated stick with it and just grow it definitely definitely and on that note is there anything you want to let our dj sessions fans know about before we let you get going back into your studio getting back to work uh, definitely, I have a new album in the works, and the first single is coming uh, soon. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, keep keep uh, watching my spaces um, because there is much on the way in new music, and I hope you will dig this. And yeah, awesome! Thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can people find out more information about you and what you got going on? Um, probably Instagram slash Voiceians. Instagram.com slash voices or my website voices.com. Check out my Spotify and see what I do. And yeah, Instagram, I think, is a good first place because I also have some links there in the link tree. But yeah. Awesome. Well, and don't forget to check out your latest release, Reverse Voices, V O I C I A N S. Look it up online, check out Reverse. It's out there. And you know, we'll be following up with you later in the year. Obviously, I want to talk to you about that single coming out, the new album. Also coming out, we'll be in contact with you, Voiceians. That will be great, man. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on the yeah. DJ sessions. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was a fun time. Don't forget to go to our website, thedjsessions.com. Find us on Twitter, find us on Instagram, Facebook, anywhere out there, the DJ sessions, hashtag the DJ sessions, hashtag TD, TDJS if you're so bold. We're on TikTok now. Look it up. A lot of food videos that I post there. Funny stuff. This is Darren and the Voiceians coming to you all the way from halfway around the world in Germany. I'm in the live studios for the virtual sessions. This is the DJ sessions. And you know what happens on the DJ sessions? The music never stops. <laughs>